morning. Good morning. I said good morning. Good morning. That's better. That's better. I'm so happy to see so many of you. I see some old faces and I see some new faces. Praise the Lord. And whether if you are a member of this church or you are here for the first time, I want to tell you, we want to tell you, we want you to feel more than welcome. And uh, praise the Lord that God has uh, given you the wisdom to come to Bracknell Church. And uh, may you grant you the wisdom to come back. Amen. On, on this day, on this exact day, three years ago, I made a big decision. On this day, three years ago, I was baptized Amen. and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Amen. And I want to tell you today, for many of you today, this will be an hour of decision. This will be an hour of decision because you will never be the same again. When you encounter Jesus, you, will, you are never the same. And I'm saying this not because of my words or what I'm going to say today, but because of what we will study in the Bible. The topic that God has put on my heart is God's prophetic last day movement. I, I think it's up, yes. The topic for today is what? The last day movement. Before we jump into the presentation, let us seek God in prayer. So let us bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son. And we humble ourselves before you. Lord, you see that commitments will be made today. Commitments will be made to you and to your glory and to your Amen. kingdom. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you send the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, that will guide us into your truth. Open our hearts. And open our minds for what will come. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have you ever felt that you were lost? Not in a spiritual sense, but you did not know where you were. It is very easy to be lost in a city or a country you've never been to or visited before. But have you ever felt lost in your hometown? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> I think there are cameras in the place. I remember I spent the last Christmas at home. And I was uh, going to the church. And Stockholm Church is in the middle of the city. And as a proud Stockholmer, I'm walking. And I'm thinking to myself, I, am, I know the ins and the outs of this great city. Until I met some tourists who wanted some guidance on how to go from place A to place B. So as I'm walking, I see some tourists. And I see in their eyes this, you know, they, they are lost. They don't know what to do. But they see me. And they approach me. And they asked me, are you from Stockholm? And I said, of course I am. Can't you see? The question itself was almost an insult. I mean, I'm a Stockholmer. People should see this. They said, all right, you're from Stockholm. Yes, we need your help. So they took the map and they said, we are here. And I said, yeah, we are here. But we want to go from this place 
to that place. I said, sure. They asked me, can you help me? Or can you help us? I said, sure, give me the map. And I took the map, and I was staring at the map, and the only thing I could say was, um, 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 let me tell you, I was not meditating. <laughs> so I turned the map upside down. That didn't work. Turned it back. Looking at the tourist. Looking back to the map. I was leaning my head to the right. As if it is going to help me. Didn't help me. To the left. That didn't help me. And after some minutes. I needed to give back the map to the tourist. And I said, sorry, I can't help you. I can't help you. Friends, I want you to see this. I could not give clear guidance to the tourist on how they can go from place A to place B. And as I was pondering upon this, God showed me a spiritual application of this. Can we as Christians, can we as Bible-believing Christians, give clear guidance to people who seek the truth? Can we give clear instructions to people who want to know who God is? Who want to know who Jesus is? Who want to understand what the Bible says? What the, what the prophecies in the Bible says and the health message and so forth? Or... Are we going to sound like me? Uh, today we are going to study a very interesting topic. Today we are going to study God's GPS. God's GPS. You know what a GPS is? You know what it does? You know, you can put it in your car or you can have it in your phone or whatever. A GPS, it helps you, you know, if you want to go to a place, it helps you to discover where you are right now and it gives you clear instruction on how to go to your destination and you have a GPS in the Bible you have a GPS in the Bible so please open your Bibles to, to the book of Exodus chapter 25 the book of Exodus chapter 25 Exodus chapter 25 Verse 8. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. And if you're there, please say Amen. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. The Bible says this. And let them make me a what? A sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Pause. Let's pause it here. G friends, I want you to see this. God is saying to Moses, now who is this God? This God is the creator of everything. This God is the creator. And he says to Moses, I will dwell among my people. How? Through the sanctuary. Through the sanctuary, God will dwell among his people. And this is what the rest of the book of Exodus and Leviticus is all about. God is with His people through the sanctuary. And this is what it describes, the different things in the sanctuary. Question. And it's an honest question. It's a legitimate question. How many of you have been bored <laughs> when you were reading the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and some parts of Numbers? All these rules... Sanctuary, you know, what does it have to do with me, right? What does it have to do with me? Friends, I wanted to tell you, tell you this, it has to do everything with you. Because what we are going to read now, your understanding of the sanctuary and who you are today, I believe by the grace of God will change forever. I guess this is just a recap. 
But this is the sanctuary. This is how it looked like. And the sanctuary in the Old Testament was divided into how many parts? Three parts, uh, three compartments. The, the first compartment was called the outer court. And the first, the courted courtyard. And the first furniture that we see is the altar of sacrifice. What happened there? If somebody committed a sin, you were basically taking an animal and an animal was slain because of your sin. So in other words, the animal is taking the sinner's place. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Theologians call this substitutionary death. The animal is taking the place of the sinner. This is the first part, all right? Altar of sacrifice. And then we had the labor. Labor. Basically, the priest, before they were going into the sanctuary itself, they were supposed to wash themselves. Do you follow me so far? All right? So they should supposed to wash themselves. Now we come into the second compartment and we find three furnitures. We have the bread, uh, the table of showbread. All right? And then we had the incense, the altar of incense, and then we had the golden lampstand. And then we come into the third compartment, which is the, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And within the Ark of the Covenant, you had the law of God. Alright? The law of God. But you see, these things in the sanctuary, they were just a shadow of the things to come. Now you say, preacher, <laughs> Sebastian, what are you talking about? Shadow of the things to come? Come on, talk to me. These things in the sanctuary, they were supposed to reflect something bigger. Yes. Are, you, are you with me? They were supposed to reflect, or they were supposed to just that, a shadow of the things to come. And they were supposed to have two fulfillments. How many? Two. two. The first is that they were all to uh, point to none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And everything in the, the sanctuary is Christ-centered. Look at this. This is beautiful. Who is the animal that is getting slain? Who is it the symbol of? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Water. Hmm. Jesus says, I am the water or living water. The bread. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Lamp. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Incense. It's a bit hard, but you see in the Old Testament, God Himself manifested Himself in a cloud it was none other than Jesus and then we have the Ark of the Covenant and within the Ark of the Covenant you had the law of God and basically in the law of God you see God's character you see the beauty of God's character so the first fulfillment is none other than to Jesus Christ but there is a second fulfillment which we not talk which we are not talking about and I want to point out that and that is that these things, they are also applicable in 2014. What do I mean by that? Do you know where you are in your Christian life? You don't understand the question. <laughs> do you know... <coughs> you see, we are supposed to walk with God, right? Yes. If we are walking with God... We should know where we are in our relationship with Him. And the, and the sanctuary gives us an answer to that question. Where are you in your walk with God? Look at this. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Altar of burnt offering. It symbolized the death of Jesus. My question to you is this. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? This is the first step in the Christian walk. Look at this. When you accept Jesus Christ, what is the ultimate step that you take? Baptism. Baptism. What was the labor all about? Washing. Washing. 
That's what you're doing. You accept Jesus and the next step that you're taking is baptized. baptism. Have you been baptized? You see, many people, they say, I am baptized, I have arrived. But you see, according to the sanctuary, at baptism, the Christian life begins. At baptism, the Christian life begins, not ends. And how do you, how do you have that relationship with Christ? You have the bread. What is the bread? The Word of God, the word of God Jesus says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So when you read the word, you come to this golden lampstand. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. We are supposed to witness. We are supposed to testify of what God has done for us. But friends, I have a question. If you are not reading the word, can you testify? And how do you maintain that close relationship with God? Altar of incense. In the book of Revelation chapter 5, the Bible says that incense is the, 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 the prayer, the prayer of the saints that comes up to God. And then we have the, the last furniture we have, the law of God. Friends, the purpose of the Christian life is to reflect the character of Jesus Christ. So this is where we begin. Altar of burnt offering, labor, and so forth and so forth. And the sanctuary gives us an answer to our very question, where am I in my, in my, in my walk with Jesus? Do you know where you are in your walk with Jesus? But let us continue. Go with me please to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 and now we are going to jump into our presentation because this has all be, uh, only been like a we have done the foundation basically for this presentation so once again I just want to recap because if you understand this then you will understand what will come are you with me so far so we have altar of burnt offering the death of Jesus labor baptism then you have bread, the word of God. You have the altar of incense, which is prayer. prayer. Very good. You have the golden lampstand, which is to witness or to test. Ex exactly. And then you have the law of God. But listen to this. Go with me to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. Because in Daniel chapter 8, we read something very, very interesting. Daniel has a vision. Daniel has a vision and it refers to the end of time. It involves a lamb, uh, a ram, sorry, and a goat. Let us understand what this, what this is all about. Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 to 28. Because we don't need to guess what these symbols are. The Bible itself, uh, the Bible interprets itself rather. And the Bible is an amazing book. Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 to 28. The Bible says this. The ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. Persia. Alright, verse 21. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and, and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, <coughs> but not with its power. And we can read 23 also. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. Now what is this all about? <laughs> Within the dream, Daniel is told that these kingdoms are Medo-Persia, Greece. Greece, very good, and Greece would be divided into how many parts? Four kingdoms, and then the Roman Empire arises. But since the vision refers to the end of time, it cannot be just the Roman Empire, it must be the Roman Church. Are you with me? It, must, it cannot be the Roman Empire itself, it is 
developing itself into an ecclesiastical power, into a church power. And it is interesting that the Bible says this, that this power would do the following. Verse 11 and verse 12. In the same chapter, verse 11 and verse 12. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away. And the place of his... Hmm. 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 We have been studying what? All right, all right. This power and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. You see, the place and the different furnitures were taken away. And I want you to understand this verse deeper. This text does not only speak about taking away Christ's ministry in heaven and casting it to the ground. This involves all of the furnitures in the sanctuary. And this power is going to replace God's GPS with its own GPS. And what I'm going to tell you now is pure history. It's pure history. So please don't be angry at me. I'm just telling you history in combination with Bible prophecy. So please don't be angry at me. The altar of sacrifice, you remember? The altar of sacrifice, which symbolized the death of Jesus for sinners on the cross of Calvary, is taken away and instead is replaced with indulgences. The sins that you have committed, you just pay some money and that's it. You are forgiven. You don't have to come to God, you just pay some money. Furniture number one, cast to the ground. Also, the laver, true biblical baptism by immersion, is replaced and instead infant baptism or sprinkling is introduced. Furniture number two, cast to the ground. When it came to bread, the Bible, God's holy word, is replaced with church tradition. And not only that, Tradition stands above what the Bible says. Furniture number three, cast to the ground. Also the altar of incense, which represents prayer, is substituted with confessional booth. Because you can't pray to God, you have to go through a priest. Furniture number four, cast to the ground. The candlestick. What is the purpose of the candlestick? It is to? To shed light. What is the opposite of light? Darkness. What is this power? What is this time period described as? The dark ages. You have taken away the word of God. And the Bible says in Psalms 119 verse 105. Thy word is a... Lamp unto my feet. The word of God is taken away. And there's darkness. Furniture number five is cast to the ground. And at last, God's holy law is substituted for man's law. Among other things, the seventh day Sabbath is changed to the first day Sabbath. Furniture number six and the entire sanctuary is cast down. God's GPS is in ruin and it lays desolate. Shall we fear? Shall we be worried? Shall we be concerned? Listen to what the Bible says in verse 13. And please pray for my voice. I don't know what has happened. Yeah, thanks.
Let us pray because this is important. Dear Heavenly Father, you see that this is an important message. And please give me the voice that I need to speak. <coughs> give me the strength to tell your message and send your Holy Spirit because this is important, Lord. This is important. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 13, the Bible says, Then I heard a Holy One speaking, and another Holy One said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the, will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the, vi- the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? The angel is distressed. What is going on? The angels see what is going on. It sees that the sanctuary is cast down. Listen to the answer. Listen to the answer. Verse 14. And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. You see, in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals a year. And due to time, I will not go into details, but we know that this time prophecy ended in 1844. You combine Daniel 9 with Daniel chapter 8, and you come to the conclusion that this ended in 1844. But it's also interesting that in some other Bible translations, it says that after the 2300 days, Thank you. It's interesting that the Bible says that after the 2300 years, in other words, in 1844, the sanctuary will be restored. Restored. The word restored means to bring back to a former, original, or normal condition. So not only will something take place in heaven, I'm not negating it, but God's blueprint, God's GPS will be restored. And this involves every single one of you who are sitting here, young people or old people. Take a look at this. Over a period of 500 years, God is beginning a reformation of restoring His GPS. In the 1300s, a man by the name of John Wycliffe started to translate the Bible so that the common people could understand it. If I would be living in the 1300s, I would follow John Wycliffe wherever he would go. The bread is restored. In the 1500s, a man by the name of Martin Luther begins the Protestant Reformation, not only showing that the Bible is the Word of God, sola scriptura, but also that you are not saved by your own works, but by grace through faith alone in Christ Jesus. The altar of sacrifice is restored. I would probably have been a Lutheran at that time during the Reformation. Praise the Lord for the Lutheran movement. In the 1500s at the same time, John Calvin, founder of the Presbyterian movement, he comes upon the scene and restores prayer that we don't need to go to a priest. We can go to God just as we are. The altar of incense is restored. Do you see a pattern? I'm so excited, sorry. (laughs) In the 1600s, John Smith, founder of the Baptist movement, comes upon the scene, and after he had studied the Bible, he found out you can't baptize, you know, infants with sprinkling. It is through submersion before people have repented of their sins. I would probably have been a Baptist in the 1600s. Praise the Lord of the Baptist movement. In the 1700s, two furnitures left. In the 1700s, John Wesley, 
the founder of the Methodist Church, comes upon the scene and he has a special burden for letting the gospel go out in the whole world. Praise the Lord for the Methodist. The candlestick is restored. Five furnitures are restored. One left. What movement would God call upon the sea in the 1800s, preferably 1844, to restore the law, God's commandments, and the final piece of missing truth, the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Amen. Beloved, you are not a Seventh-day Adventist by accident. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist by pure chance. This movement has a bir prophetic birth certificate. And what a time to be part of God's prophetic last day movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Amen. Just as God called Luther and Calvin and Wesley and all these reformers to restore pieces of God's GPS, nevertheless, the Reformation did not end there. We read in the Great Controversy. The Reformation did not end as many suppose and with Luther. It is to be continued to the close of this world's history. God is calling in these last days for His last day movement to stand up and finish the work and the reformation. Amen. You have probably seen on the YouTube, it's a clip that has gone viral. Some couple of weeks ago, Pope Francis sent an Episcopal bishop called Tony Palmer to proclaim a message of unity to a Protestant gathering. In the Pope's message, he says he believes the Pope himself is like Joseph in the Old Testament. He has been mistreated by and separated from his brothers. And if you know this story on the Old Testament, it is the brothers of Joseph coming to him begging for bread who bowed down before him and moved to where he was in Egypt. Almost as important as the Pope's message is the preamble given by his friend and envoy, uh, Anglican Bishop Tony Palmer. And in this clip on YouTube, you can find him on YouTube, you will find him, uh, he's declaring at least three times in his introductory remarks, the protest is over, the protest is over, and the protest is over. Speaking, of course, of the Protestant Reformation. He, was even, he even was so bold as to add, maybe we are all Catholics now. And then some couple of days ago, he sent another message where he said, we are living in a post-Protestant era. And if you are giving or preaching the truth of Protestantism, you are committing spiritual racism. Friends, I want to tell you today that the Protestant Reformation is not over. Amen. It is time to rekindle the flames of the Reformation. Amen. Lifting up the Bible as the centrality and Jesus Christ as the center of our beliefs. Amen. Join the Advent movement. Amen. Events taking place all around us today are fast fulfilling the prophecies in the books of Daniel, Matthew and Revelation. And everything seems to be shaking. Political problems are evident all over the world. Moral and cultural decay is rampant. And even the economies of the world are just a hairbreadth away from collapse. And just before our very eyes, we are seeing subtle ecumenical movements where Protestants, Catholics, and other world religions are uniting and coming together to form a new world religious order. And while some people may say, uh, Sebastian, uh, uh, this is not so important, and these things, they do not really matter. Friends, 
I humbly believe that these events all around us declare that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Amen. And this is not a message of fear, but this is a message of hope. Amen. Because Jesus himself has promised in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 3, I will come again. Jesus has promised to come back. And that is why we can look into the future, not with the eyes of pessimism, but with the eyes of optimism. Amen. Not with the eyes of despair, but with the eyes of hope. Amen. That there is still hope. Join the Advent movement. Jesus is coming. Amen. Ellen White, one of the pioneers of the church, said, there is no change in the messages that God has sent in the past. The work in the cities is the essential work for this time. When the cities are worked as God would have them, the result will be a setting in operation of a mighty movement such as we have not yet witnessed. While this movement is yet to come, nevertheless, I, what a privilege it is to be part of God's prophetic last day movement and sharing the three angels messages of Revelation chapter 14 we are supposed to preach Jesus Christ and his righteousness we are supposed to call people to the awareness of the judgment calling people uh, to the awareness of God as being the creator who has created this world in six literal 24 hour days calling people out of Babylon and to warn people not to accept the mark of the beast and the image of the beast. Amen. And instead, turning them to Jesus Christ. Join the Advent movement. Amen. Jesus is coming. Amen. The three angels' messages is just as important in our day as Noah's message was in his day and John the Baptist's message was in the first century. Once again, God has sent a special message at a special time to prepare a special people for a special event. The second coming of Jesus Christ. And this is our unique task, friends. Brothers and sisters, the time has come to proclaim God's eternal truth as it is in Jesus. Join the Advent movement. Jesus is coming. In November last year, now you have to listen. In November last year, God gave me a plan. God gave me a vision of the future. And this plan was all about starting to finish the work. And God I don't know how, and it might sound crazy for you. God said, Sebastian, start to do evangelism in Stockholm. Now, if you know Sweden, you know where Sweden is, by the way? Oh, good, 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 good. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Stockholm and Sweden is very hard um, to work at. It's one of those countries that are, you know, the highest atheists are living there, you know. It's a secular country. And I did not understand. God, I don't understand. Why do you want me to do that? Stockholm! I'm studying at Newbold College. God said, do something in Stockholm. But Lord, I'm studying at Newbold at the moment. I have a great time at Bracknell Church. No. Do something in Stockholm. Alright. So I started to study what the Bible says on evangelism and witnessing. What the spirit of prophecy has to say about medical missionary work. And if you do not know what medical missionary work is, it is basically the gospel put into practice. And, we started, and I started to study and I started to re, uh, write down a document. And I sent this document to the pastor in Stockholm. And I said, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. But you have said... Do this. I said, all right, I'm going to do that. Sent a document to the pastor, and lo and behold, the pastor said, praise the Lord, this is what we are looking for. Amen. 
because from the general conference they have now initiated this plan of mission to the cities and it is it is at Stockholm as well and the church the pastor said you know we didn't we didn't have any plan and now when the plan is here we can start to work and now what it what we have done in some couple of weeks time we have been praying, we have been fasting, we've been studying the Bible. There have been an evangelistic committee. And in some couple of weeks' time, the church is going to participate in different health conferences. It is going to arrange health expos. It is going to do all kinds of stuff just to create contact with people. And then, at the end of May, by the grace of God, I'm going to hold my first evangelistic campaign. Amen. And, the, and it is called, There is Hope. There is hope. Mm. If there is anything that we should preach in a time like this, is that there is still hope. Amen. So please pray for that initiative in Stockholm. And as far as I'm concerned, as we've been talking to, to the elders, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, that initiative will be taken to Bracknell Church. Amen. So please pray for what is going on. In closing, we are standing before men and angels. We are standing before the entire universe in this great controversy. The unfallen worlds and the heavenly angels are watching us to finish the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, let us plead for revival and reformation in our own lives. Let us plead for revival in Bracknell Church. Let us plead for revival in England. Let us plead for revival in the world church. But don't pray. <laughs> it's amazing. Don't pray, Lord, here we are. Send us. But pray that dangerous prayer. Pray that bold prayer. Lord, here I am. Send me. I want to encourage you to become an important part of God's last day movement. And this movement comprises of you. Young people and old people. And God is calling you to join the Advent movement. Jesus is coming. And I want to challenge you. And I want to challenge particularly the young people. The young people in the church. Go beyond the typical expectations of youth. Don't just come to church and leave here excited about the Advent movement. May you be the change you wish to seek in your local church. Amen. You know, President uh, Kennedy, he said, and I didn't, did not write it down. This is a thought that came up. President Kennedy said, Think not. Oh, Lord, please help me. <laughs> Don't ask, thank you. Don't ask what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Let us apply that principle and say, let us not ask what the church can do for you, but ask what you can do for your church. We read this in Review and Herald. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. Let us pray for revival and reformation. Let us seek God every day for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because this is indeed our greatest need. Just as the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles, so the Holy Spirit will fall in the latter rain to empower us to finish the work. And God has a special task for you to do in this work. Join the Advent movement. Please, next slide. And the spirit of prophecy tells us once again, it is the privilege of every Christian, not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're all who profess His name, Bearing fruit to His glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. 
quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. Amen. Let the words of Jesus be fulfilled in this generation. That the gospel of the kingdom should be preached into all the world as a testimony. Then the end will come. Join the Advent movement. Jesus is coming soon. And I long to see Jesus come. Even more than I ever had. One and a half year ago, I lost my precious mother. She went to sleep in Jesus, awaiting His soon return. As a mother, she believed in me, and I want to tell you, God believes you. God believes in you also. This movement, this church, which started by young people, and young people will play a pivotal role in finishing the work. And my question to you is this. Is it your desire today to recommit your life to Jesus Christ? Do you want to become a part of God's prophetic last day movement? Do you want to plead for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the latter rain? Do you wish to see Jesus come? If this is your desire, would you like to stand with me? When Jesus gave appeals, He gave them openly. And the commitments were done openly. And thank you for standing up. Turn to somebody next to you in two or three, and let us pray together, friends. Let us seal this commitment that we have, be, that we have made. Let us seal this commitment by praying for one another. It's a beautiful thing to pray for each other. Let us pray for Bracknell Church, or pray for your own church, and pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit which we so need. And after you have prayed, I will close with a prayer.